So. Thank you. Good afternoon. I think you missed out the most important part of the introduction. I'm actually from Hyderabad, so it's good to be back home. <coughs> so, uh, thanks to Supriya ji for holding it here. So that gives one more reason to uh, visit home. Uh, happy to join this first of its kind uh, technology conclave. And you know, interesting that you're doing it in Hyderabad, which is also a technology city. I mean, this. Is particular area is called high-tech city, uh, but even before it became high-tech city, you know, Hyderabad was always home to many premier, uh, you know, R&D organizations like CCMB for, you know, genetics, IICT where a lot of chemical technology, I'm a chemical engineer, by the way, so uh, DRDO to name a few. And, uh, you know, growing up here, you would read news about all these technology giants and, you know, the people who build these institutions. And it gave the city its unique character, and all of that played a role in, you know, in the, during the formative years uh, from a technology standpoint. So again, I'm very thankful that we're doing this here. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't come here yesterday. I was tied up in Rajya Sabha TV, which is my other responsibility, where we are doing a lot of hiring. Uh, so my apologies for missing out on most of the action and coming here on the penultimate session, that to after lunch, and I'm between you and T. Well, hopefully I'll keep everyone awake, so uh, <laughs> let's get started. Uh, you know, on what does technology mean in broadcasting? What, sh what should, you know, what should our approach be? How should we go about it? How should we think of technology? And when I look at this question, you know, uh, several dimensions come to mind. I think the first uh, is, you know, where is technology headed in the broadcasting sector? Where is it headed across the world? And more importantly, what role do we see for India in that global future? And I think following from this question is, what is the state of broadcasting in India? Uh, and what should be the technology roadmap for this country? Uh, and then f following from that uh, is the role of the public broadcaster. Where do we see the public broadcaster? Because on the one hand, we have several responsibilities, several obligations. On the other hand, we have several aspirations and, and of course, many constraints. So within all of this, how do we imagine the technology future of the public broadcaster? And extending from that comes the question of skills and manpower uh, for this future that we want to you know, imagine for ourselves. And lastly, what is the culture of technology? What is the environment? enabling environment, enabling ecosystem. I know Hitesh had touched upon it uh, in his presentation. I'm sure others must have mentioned it as well. Uh, so that we can nurture uh, this technology future. talk about convergence. The convergence today means that it no longer matters where content is created, how it is created, where it is stored, how it is delivered. Because as far as the consumer is concerned, they just don't care. As long as they get the content that they want, when they want, where they want, they will take it, they will consume it. And uh, uh, you know, interestingly, I remember when we were growing up and you would go to the barber shop for a haircut have the traditional radio playing you know, songs and uh, whatever comes on radio in those days. 
And these days I go to the uh, hair stylist. He's streaming songs of YouTube playlist on a geo phone. So it's a very different uh, model, right? And and the phone is hooked to the speaker system in the uh, in the salon, and, and you know everyone can listen and so on. Uh, so from our era of everyone listening to the same content on the broadcast spectrum or on the broadcast airwaves, we have now moved to a highly personalized, highly targeted world where the algorithms on YouTube determine what song comes next uh, and, and that's what you're listening to. Right? Uh, so that has changed dramatically that uh, how can What this means is that the distinct identity that broadcasting enjoyed all these years is now blurring uh, with both telecom and internet appropriating that identity. And this is happening world over, that telecom companies are merging with internet companies uh, to create you know, giant media giants, which are then acquiring broadcasters and content creators. So the entire scenario is changing dramatically. A great example of this is Amazon, that Amazon started with selling books online and then ended up creating a whole bunch of technology infrastructure to deliver uh, this e-commerce. Then they realized that the infrastructure they've created can be sold as a service. So hence came cloud-based services. And then they realized that, you know, we've created so much cloud-based firepower that now we can deliver our own media. So they created a end user device, Kindle, then Fire Stick, then came streaming and so on. Uh, so one entity has innovated both backwards and forwards across value chains and disrupted all of them, uh, be it retailing, be it media, and so on. Uh, so I think that is the kind of future that you're going to see, where one organization innovates on multiple fronts. Uh, so because what is Amazon? I mean, is it a retailer? Is it a store? Is it a media company? Is it a data center company? Is it a consumer device company? It's all of that. Right? And it is that multifaceted character that is what is important if you have to survive in this new uh, converged digital reality. The other interesting thing is that the consumer is way ahead of us, right? Like, especially broadcasters. Even before broadcasters streaming or digital on demand, the consumer was already consuming content way ahead of them. And broadcasters are still playing catch up. And that is what has made uh, you know, this digital reality is so challenging for broadcasters the world over. It's not unique to India, it is happening across the world. Uh, to make matters worse, you have artificial intelligence getting smarter and better, more creative, to the point where soon it will make human beings redundant. I was just watching a few weeks back, uh, there was this AI bot delivering news. I know Mayangji and I have been struggling, you know, where are we going to get our talent? I mean, we'll probably have to create bots because, you know, we may not get the right talent that we want. Uh, so soon you could have artificial intelligence enabled bots delivering news in prime time. You wouldn't even know the difference. So the future is not some, you know, uh, distant science fiction, uh, you know, dystopia. It is already here. It is a reality and it is staring us in the face. And I think that is the uh, challenge that we have to, uh, you know, confront. So where do we see India in all this, where, you know, in this global future that is emerging? I think we've been very timid in our imagination on the role and place for India in the global broadcasting order. Uh, why do I say this? Let me give an example. Let's take the example of cricket and IPL. You know, it would not be an exaggeration to say that there would be no future for cricket in the world without IPL and India. Cricket is perhaps the finest example of how India leveraged the power of the market to redefine the future of cricket while ensuring you know, that future is firmly located in the Indian subcontinent, and that is thanks to IPL. So today, if you are an aspiring cricketer anywhere in the globe, uh, it is your dream and aspiration to come to India and uh, play in IPL. You know, this is sort of the reverse of what we IT engineers used to do two decades back, you know, imagining a future going to the US, getting that H1 visa and you know, working there. Cricket has reversed that, that whole equation. Right. 
So today, India is the global destination for cricket dollars and cricketing talent, thanks to IPL. Why can't we become the global destination for broadcasting dollars and talent by leveraging our strength as the world's largest democracy and open market for content? Why can't we do this for broadcast? So when we you know, rethink what is our policy focus for broadcasting and how technology should evolve, I think we have to think about the power of the market and think of how this global future for broadcasting, how innovation can be created here in India, how this future can be scripted here in India. I think India has all the ingredients to emerge as the hub for global innovation in broadcasting. But it will call for sustained and you know, very focused efforts. Uh, for the first time, I think, in our recent history, we have three policy initiatives which have all come together to create the right conditions. You have Digital India, you have Startup India, you have Make in India. And thanks to all of these three, today we have a startup based in Bangalore, as an example, which is creating the chipsets that will bring broadcasting to smartphones. So just like your smartphone is capable of receiving FM signals, tomorrow your smartphone will be able to receive your digital terrestrial signals across technologies, across the spectrum, and in a very cost-effective, power-consumption-effective manner. Right? And this innovation is happening here in India for the markets across the world, be it Korea, be it for the United States. So how do we take advantage of these developments to grow the sector? I think there's something that calls for serious introspection and you know, very urgent policy measures uh, from the ministry. Another area is audience measurement. You know, listening and viewing habits in India are rapidly changing. As uh, was pointed out earlier with the emergence of the third screen, the fourth screen, viewing has become very, very personalized. And again, this is an opportunity area where India can lead the way on how real-time census-wide measurement can be done, given the size of our market and the diversity of our audience segments. I mean, the diversity that you see in India, you don't see anywhere in the world, right? Both in terms of socioeconomic segments, languages, regions, the sheer volume of cultural diversity. So, so if you can solve audience measurement at this scale, a billion people, with this complexity, you can you know, do audience measurement anywhere in the world. So there's another area you know, potential for innovation and uh, creating the future. The third is on technology-driven pricing innovation. Again, this is an area where India can lead and show the, way the, show the world the way forward. Uh, today, if you see the big shift that is happening is from paying a monthly cable bill or a monthly DTH bill to shifting to a Netflix or an Amazon or YouTube. And this is a shift that's happening in all the advanced markets. And soon it will be a reality in India as well. And recently, you had TRAI, the sector regulator, uh, coming up with a new tariff structure. And that has you know, had a tremendous impact on consumer behavior. And that's a wake-up call to broadcaster that if you don't innovate in pricing using technology, uh, then you will become redundant and you will uh, start, you know, struggle for survival. And this is true for both distribution platforms and the broadcasters. So innovation in pricing using technology is another opportunity area. And I'm very happy that we've created a model for the rest of the world with DD Friedrich. Uh, I'm sure when DD Friedrich was envisaged uh, and originally uh, launched, they probably didn't imagine this would happen. It's an uh, unintended consequence. But now what we've done, we've created the world's largest market for open access broadcasting using DD Fredish. With, I mean, people say 30 million households, uh, but my suspicion is it is probably a much bigger number just by going at looking at the cricket bark ratings. When you have the same cricket match, aired on DD Sports and also aired on, you know, Star or Sony and so on. And you look at the number of households that tuned into DD Sports. The number is so high, it's almost on par with the private uh, channel. And sometimes the viewership is even higher on DD Sports. And that's a strong indicator of how widespread the reach of DD Friedrich must be. 
another interesting measure which has emerged in the last couple of weeks since uh, we moved to the new uh, lineup on DD Friedish is that the channels that exited Friedish have seen a dramatic drop in their ratings. The ratings are not public, so hence nobody's talking about it. Uh, but I think within these four walls, we can definitely discuss uh, this reality that uh, DD Fredish today can make or break a free-to-air channel, and I think that's, that's a reality. And that is the power of this open access platform that we've created. Uh, and this has no parallel in the world, and it is definitely a template for the future of public broadcasting. So what is unique about the DD Fredish model? Right? It is an open access platform. It has universal reach. And in that sense, it is fulfilling its public purpose because anybody can access it across the social uh, spectrum. The second most interesting thing is the economics of DD Fredish. It is governed by a very transparent, technology enabled e auction process, which makes it very fair, non discriminatory. Nobody has any questions about it. The only complaints people have had is the pricing. But nobody has questioned the process. And that is possible because we have made it completely transparent by using technology. And I think that is a very important characteristic of DD Fredish. The third, I think that is, this is the most important one for me personally uh, as the uh, CEO of this organization. And I would urge everyone to pay attention to this. It is the revenue productivity. And by that, I mean the ratio of the revenue that it earns and the manpower that goes into running it which is probably about you know, a few crores per person. And that is probably the highest, uh, which makes it the most revenue productive platform or service that we operate using public infrastructure. And that is what is very unique about DD Fredish. And then, of course, it, it services a whole broad spectrum of households. That is very clear. Uh, so what are the lessons that we can draw from how DD Fredish has been successful? to the rest of the things that we do. I think first lesson is that it is possible to both fulfill our public obligations and be commercially viable. And I think both these come together in DD Fredish if you put the right kind of technology platform and you innovate with the right business model. Because often, uh, you know, there's an argument that I come across that, no, we are a public broadcaster. We can't do this or we have to do that. So my challenge is that it is not this or that. DD Fredish shows that you can do this and that. You can be fulfilling your obligations and you can be commercially viable if you think innovatively, if you create the right platform. Secondly, think economic, economies of scale, because at that scale, you can become self-sustaining with very high revenue productivity. So I think that way, DD Fredish again is very unique that it can be self-sustaining even if you made it a separate entity. Uh, thirdly, to be platform-based in our transactions. And the moment we are platform-based in our transactions, it automatically brings in the transparency, it brings in the fairness, uh, it ensures accountability, and, and it levels the playing field. So how do we become platform-based in our other areas, be it films procurement, content procurement, uh, how we engage talent on a need basis. So these are all areas that are you know, ripe for moving to a platform-based model. Because that will also do away with a lot of the problems that we have, the legacy problems, be it settlements not being done, billing not being accurate, all sorts of litigations. All of that will go away if we move to a platform-based model. So these are some of the lessons that I think we should take uh, to the rest of our operations if we have to be ready for this you know, converged digital future uh, that everyone has been talking about. The next area is that is critical is from a skills and manpower standpoint. Uh, I think it's very important that we recognize that we are at a turning point in our journey. Uh, and at this turning juncture, at this juncture, we have to look at two models that are in front of us. On the one hand is the BSNL model. All of us have been uh, reading in the news, you know, the challenges that BSNL is going through. On the other hand is the ISRO model where, you know, month after month, there's a new launch, a new satellite, a new space vehicle. So the question to me is, how do I avoid the pitfalls of a struggling BSNL while accomplishing the frugal innovation that has put ISRO on the global map? So how do I 
be more like an ISRO uh, while avoiding the fate of a BSNL, right? And I think that is something that uh, we have to think hard about on all of our decisions on technology. Specifically, I think every engineer has to uh, think of himself or herself as an innovator and come up with a skills roadmap that what are the skills that I need to acquire to be relevant in this new future. I know over the decades there has been a lot of complacency, a lot of cynicism, you know, that this is how things are, this is how things have always been, and that has become far too commonplace in our organization. But then if we have to survive and thrive, we have to overcome that. Uh, we have to reinvent ourselves as innovators, and most importantly, we have to think digital first. So if there's any new initiative, any new project, think what can I do differently if I thought about it with a digital first mindset. Uh, and most importantly, I think we have to set the bar high on ourselves. And I think this conclave is a great example of that, that you set a bar very high that, you know, we want a quality conclave, we want international participation. Uh, we have people from the private sector like uh, Rohit Bansalji to talk to us. I think that, that, is, that should be our uh, approach to everything, that set the bar high, don't compromise on quality. Uh, you know, aspire for a culture of excellence. Uh, because often we just aim for the low-hanging fruit and, you know, we are happy. That should not be the mindset. Reskilling and knowledge management. I think these will be the two biggest challenges in the next five years. Uh, because we know we have an aging workforce and uh, we have rapid technology obsolescence. And how do we confront both of these challenges? Uh, so both of these will have to be dealt with. Uh, with getting the right skills to the right people uh, and capturing the knowledge that the generation that is retiring, uh, their knowledge, their experiences, capturing all of that, codifying it, putting it into best practices that the fresh blood can then take over. One area that I can think of is live telecast. I think that's something really Doordashan can feel proud about because nobody in the private sector does live coverages on the scale that you do, at the frequency that you do, with the kind of complexity that you deal with, be it Independence Day, be it Republic Day, be it the launch of a tunnel in Jammu Kashmir or in a bridge and so on. So the knowledge, the best practices, the skills that go into do this have to be captured, that essence has to be captured and passed on to the next generation. To address all of this, I think ultimately we'll have to create a culture of technology. And I think this also calls for some very honest introspection at, at the leadership level within all of us, right? Are we being agents of change or are we just, you know, preserving status quo? Are we planning for tomorrow or are we still playing catch up with yesterday? And I think this is true, especially of our technology planning cycle, that we are still, you know, trying to implement technologies which were new a decade back. While our technology planning has to be about what will happen five years from now, what will happen 10 years from now, and planning for it today. Are we solving tomorrow's problems or are we solving yesterday's problems? And then are we looking for excuses why something should not be done? Most importantly, are we leading by example in the use of technology? Uh, it is one thing to say that you know, every channel, every service should be on social media, but how many of us are hands-on on social media? Because if you're not hands-on on social media, how will the team below take to social media in the same way, right? So leading by example is going to be very important. And are we open to new ideas? Or has we, you know, become very closed in the way we think? Are we empowering those below to experiment and innovate? Because the way, only way you're going to create a culture of technology is to experiment. You will have to experiment. Some will fail, some will be successful. But if you're afraid of experimenting, you will not embrace new technology. So you will have to have that confidence that you can take the leap of faith when it comes to technology. Uh, we can do, you know, as many technology conclaves that we want, uh, but unless we discard this mindset that just looks for reasons not to experiment with technology, we'll not get anywhere. So we have to create this culture, this environment of experimentation. And this culture of technology has to permeate all levels of the organization, right from the top all the way down. And then I think what Hitesh said was very important, that it has to go beyond the four walls. We have to nurture and create an ecosystem, an ecosystem of innovation. So we have to 
engage with academia, universities, labs, startups, public-private partnerships, because only when we create the right ecosystem will the right solutions emerge, because we will not have answers to all the questions within our four walls. We will not have solutions to all the problems within our four walls. But if we have the right ecosystem, the partners will come up with those answers. So we have to be the enabler there. I think a billion people democracy deserves a public broadcaster that the world looks up to. So it is our responsibility, all of us in this room, to create that public broadcaster. And I think this technology conclave is the first step towards that, where we become a technology savvy organization. So my congratulations to the DG and everyone who put together uh, this effort and to the ministry for its support. Uh, let me conclude with a quote from the Rigveda. Uh, it goes, Ano bhadraha kratavo yanto vishwata. What it means is that we need to have an open mind, receptive to ideas from all directions, because only then will we be successful as a technology-enabled organization. Thank you. We can take some questions or... Thank you very much. That was an extremely wonderful and informative session. And uh, the session is now open. We can take some uh, questions. And people who wish to ask questions may kindly raise their hands. And before they ask the questions, they are requested to kindly introduce themselves. Can you be a little louder, please? Yeah. Good question. I'm not the right guy to answer that. You'll have to ask them. But what I hear is, by the end of the year is what I hear that they'll be ready. Just raise your hands if you have any question, please. Yeah, at the back. Ji. Yeah, I think content create leadership, the right talent, in a decentralized manner, we can create these centers of excellence. Uh, but that should not stop there, because the moment you have one center of excellence, others should pick up from, you know, what is working. So, for example, what is working in Girnar, or what is working in Sayadri or Chandana, those lessons have to, you know, uh, get transported to the other centers. So, they pick up on those best practices, they create the same environment. And I think that is how, uh, you know, we can create content at scale once you talk of, you know, hundreds of channels uh, within our uh, organization. Uh, another aspect, I think, again, this I have not seen in this, because I have worked in several industries over the decades, uh, both uh, myself in the company that I belong to, as well as working with clients from various industries. And one of the things that I've seen in every industry is a very mature, codified process of quality, be it CMM, in the software IT sector, be it ISO and you know, other sectors, uh, you know, Malcolm, Baldrige, Six Sigma, and so on. Somehow I've not seen in broadcasting that discipline, that these are our standard procedures, these are our quality measures, and this is how we will benchmark every center, every kendra, every station. And it's a little surprising to me that this entire sector somehow escaped that whole phase for whatever reasons. I think we have to bring that discipline. We have to borrow from you know, these various industries and bring that discipline into our industry. So that if Girnar is measured at a certain level, Sayadri is measured at a certain level based on certain parameters, 
how do the others replicate that? They can be a very systematic, codified way of imparting these best practices and, uh, you know, what works. Yeah, please, Mishra ji. In front. Yaha pe la dije, Mike. See, now, thankfully, we've reached a phase where funding will not be an issue. D DG knows that well, right now we have the money to spend. But the question is, how we spend it? Because my biggest worry, when I see that we had not settled bills of Buniyad for decades, that there are unsettled cases and litigations, my worry is that if I spend another 100 crores, am I going to create another 100 cases which I'll, you know, future generations will keep dealing with? So we have to get our execution right. If we can get our execution model right, there is no stopping from, you know, spending money on in-house content. But to get our execution right, as I said, you know, more technology, more process discipline, best practices, ensure that everything is transparent, fair, at the same time ensure quality. How do we achieve all of this? I think we need a model and once we can replicate that model, absolutely, we'll do a lot more in-house content. Yeah, anybody else, please? Chandira ji? Yeah. And then I'll come back to you. That's a great question. I think we have to do both. I think the best example uh, is the Prime Minister, uh, that he is able to relate to everyone, though he is very savvy in his use of technology at the same time, you know, is very. I think that's a good example that we have to be relevant to all segments of the society, all aspects of what a consumer wants. At the top end, you're right. There's a certain consumer segment that wants digital, wants, you know, all the latest stuff. At, a, at the bottom of the strata, there's a different household uh, which has different priorities. We, have, we as the public broadcaster have to be relevant to this entire spectrum. And I think our, that's our challenge, that how do we be relevant to all of them? Uh, I think, again, I'll go back to Freedish. Freedish is a great example. 55 to 25 ratio. <laughs> 55 commercial channels, 25 public channels, right? And uh, so, so your commercial activity is so efficient that it is also paying for your public activity. That is a model that we have to figure out. How, to, how can we replicate that in other areas like we did it in British? Do we have any more questions? I think there were some questions in the back. Yeah. Kindly hand over the mic there. Sir. Uh, so 
back and help me serve or maybe you can probably serve the Lord myself. We should identify some trends, some slots for entertainment also, some government policies also, where we are missing everything in the trends. Like uh, we are the public subscribers, we are doing for the people, we have to highlight the policy of the government, but we are not going to do it. Differentiate this uh, What is the question there? I didn't get the question. No, I think all these are valid questions, but the way to answer them is to go by data. So you have to have a method of measurement, taking feedback, assessing what is working, what is not working, with which audience or which, which language and which format, and then do what is right uh, based on what is working, and then if something is not working, then get rid of it, right? So you need that system of continuous monitoring, measurement, analysis, and improvement. Only then you can answer these questions because there's no one right answer. Whether all channels should air movies or not, I don't know the answer to that. But the only way I can find the answer to that is looking at the audience data, doing some audience survey, looking at the feedback, and then experimenting, do some A-B testing. What if I tested this format, maybe it works better. Maybe if I tested a different format, maybe it's not working as good, right? So you have to be very analytics driven. And I think that is the key thing, that unless you're an analytics-driven organization in this reality where you have to, you know, service a range of audiences, it will be very difficult. Uh, so, so yes, we have to find answers to these questions, but the way to find those answers is to look at data, look at analytics, and determine what works for which format and which language and, you know, which time band. Have any more questions? Yes? See, free dish address is one problem where you want a national footprint for content which is national. Your question of very localized uh, content, uh, you know, it would again depend on uh, community radio is one example. Uh, digital terrestrial, assuming we get the chipsets onto phones at an economical price, that may take off. Uh, the internet is of course today the easiest way in which you can have highly localized, personalized content. And the internet has lowered the barrier for user-generated content, right? It is easy for anyone to have their own YouTube channel. It's easy for anyone to, you know, live stream what is happening in their neighborhood uh, or in their school and so on. So that barrier has been lowered. The distribution is very easy on the internet. Uh, but the challenge, of course, is the internet has become very noisy because there are so many sources of content. So audiences have become very fragmented. Uh, but that's the nature. The moment you go more local and more personalized, there will be this fragmentation of audience. On the other hand, if you are, you know, you want a national audience, then your content will become less and less targeted. It will be more broad-based. And I think that dichotomy will be there. I don't think that will go away anytime soon. Uh, to specifically answer your question on how do we go about doing it, I think uh, community radio, digital terrestrial, to the extent that, you know, uh, the economics works out. Until then, I think internet is the best way. Uh, so every PGF, every Kendra should create a digital footprint for themselves. I, I went to Tirupati recently. I saw 
they had state of the art equipment hardly any content being generated i mean it is just inexcusable so i told them why don't you start your own youtube channel and at least create local content for tirupati because you got state of the art technology there why not right and i think that is how we have to challenge ourselves because everyone will not get a satellite channel anytime soon because that capacity is limited but who is stopping you from doing anything on the internet there is no stopping so so i think we have to think innovatively in uh, on these dimensions kindly hand over the mic there great suggestion i think in fact we are also thinking on those lines that we should have some co-branded channels in these genres because we may not have in house expertise in every area but if we partner with someone we can create a kids channel we can create a movies channel absolutely no reason why we should not do that uh, so hopefully in the next few months we'll figure that out we have an opportunity right now because you have a number of channels that exited free dish so there's a vacuum as far as the free to air market is concerned for quality entertainment so it is our opportunity to be lost so we have to now step up and you know fill that vacuum see the mandate doesn't exist in a vacuum right the mandate comes with a cost who's going to bear the cost that is the question so you can you know end up like a bsnl where you're not viable you're not commercially viable you become redundant and you're not able to no longer fund your operations do we want to be in that situation or do we want to be smart about how we fulfill our obligations right that don't lose sight of your mandate but be very smart about it so that you go about it in a creative way where you are self sustaining you are able to fund your operations i think that is a key thing so so hence my suggestion would be that yes you have a purpose you have a mandate but go about it in a smart manner and i think freedash is a good example of that where you've achieved both the objectives commercial sustainability and your public mandate do we have any more questions I'm M S Dohan, uh, D D. Uh, sir, my uh, couple of questions. Uh, one for distribution of the content over social media or uh, any uh, O T T. There is a need for the content delivery network C D N. And many leading nations like France uh, in recent years they have developed their own. For longer term, it is a strategic requirement. Do Prasar Bharti have any plan for C D N network own C D N network number one? Second. Uh, railway uh, started some leasing out oven your oven wagon similarly we have some of the studios which are not being properly utilized due to many reasons uh, can we uh, lease uh, not lease out 
we can share some of the time, say morning uh, uh, seven hours to some uh, companies or some association. For example, Patiala, there is a cultural center of North Zone and perhaps they can uh, create content or they can uh, provide it to the university or anything like that so that our assets can be optimally utilized. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I think, in fact, these are the ideas that should emerge out of our technology planning cycle, right? How do we more optimally utilize our assets, get more money? You're already doing it with towers. You're doing it with your common infrastructure for FM. No reason why you can't do it on the studio side. Uh, and similarly, on your content delivery network, and that's another area to think about, uh, definitely. Absolutely. I think the time is right for, uh, you know, promoting our platforms, given the vacuum that has been created in the FTA market. So our new lineup on Freedish, once our MPEG-4 auction is done, you know, whatever new lineup is there, all of that should be marketed. Similarly, the experiments that you have done in uh, DTT uh, with uh, an educational channel, uh, some of those things can be publicized. So, yeah, we should uh, definitely do that. Anyone else? Okay. Evening, sir. Uh, myself, Prem Prakash Shukla from Doordarshan, Lucknow. My question is uh, rather on regulatory side. Sir, as a copyright act, it permits seamless streaming to news channels. There is no uh, regulatory issues. But once you come to GC channels for this uh, seamless streaming, there are a lot of regulatory issues. So my first uh, question is that uh, to meet the co copyright issues at the Kendras, we must have a legal cell. The way for the technology that prior art search is done, so if you want to put a program on the internet, that uh, prior art search will be necessary. And uh, my second question is that uh, for uh, seamless streaming, first issue comes commercial, and uh, second issue comes rights. So when a regulatory framework for that will be put up so that GCs can go for a seamless streaming. Thank you. See, copyright issues are going to be very important uh, in this digital era. Uh, and uh, I think we have been, for whatever reasons, legacy reasons, we have not been very conscious about them. Uh, but I think going forward, uh, we have to, as you rightly said, at the Kendra level, at the content creation level, there has to be more awareness of IPR, more awareness of copyright issues, so that we create content in the right way and are able to exploit it, you know, both terrestrially and digitally and on satellite. Uh, so, so that is something we have to work on. Uh, uh, and as far as streaming is concerned, uh, as in when we acquire content, we must insist on digital rights. Once that is done, then it becomes easier for you to, you know, exploit the internet channel. So, for example, in sports, every time a proposal comes to me, I tell them that ensure you get digital rights. So, in recent times, they put Davis Cup on YouTube and we got revenue out of it, even though, you know, on TV we probably got no advertisement, but on digital at least we got some money. Same thing with chess, hockey, uh, you know, some soccer matches and so on. 
so, so ensure that when you're acquiring content, you also acquire digital rights. Uh, I think similarly, recently, KBC, we, we again, we factored that in that we'll make sure it is available digitally and so on. Please hand over the mic there. Uh, 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 my question is that I want to know if any plan is there to push uh, the uh, content on DTH, our DTH pre-dish, uh, for viewers to choose whenever they want to see. Like uh, Mr. Manas was telling, some information we are missing or some the viewer are missing. So the, through satellite, if we can push to the setup box, the user can see it anytime, whenever they want, like weather, health, agriculture, or headlines, by putting a one switch, they can see that information. So is there any plan to push that type of facility on that? I think that's a good suggestion. So I think ideas like this should feed into our technology planning. So when we build more capacity in Fridish, we have to think about this use case, that apart from the MPEG-4 and MPEG-2 and HD channels, there will also be some capacity for on-demand content that can be pushed over uh, directly to the set-top boxes. So, sir, in that case, if the, the box has to have some memory, then only it can be done and uh, with 24 hours cycle, it can be erased and the new information can come and the viewer can see whenever they want for within 24 hours or whenever it is updated from the head end. So we should have a roadmap for the yes, DD setup box that first generation yeah. will have these capabilities, second generation will have HD, yeah. third will have interactivity, so on. So that's what my point is. Yeah. Sir, I'm Anjani Kumar, I'm DDG operations, I'm working with you only. My question is about mainly the feedback what we have been talking about. The, what we have been delivering as a broadcaster and what people take it and what feedback we get. These are three distinct entities and uh, everyone has their own interest. Like broad, broadcast as per definition has been one too many. So it never used to have a written part. We since the starting had been broadcasting and what the written path was is the family gossip going on, gossip going on, people discussing about different programs in different parties and all that was one feedback earlier. Later on with this audience measurement system it came, it used to be skewed because people, the person who's taking that measurement will give what he wants. They will skew it up the process and which we have observed earlier with our ARU also and with BARC also, TAM rating, everywhere we have seen that. So how much can we rely on this? Because first this the sample size is so small, then when we extrapolate it to our population, it, it has come to one to thousands. So how do we take this? Uh, we have to take it with a pinch of salt. And we need to have certain more feedback systems, like what we are working on census base. Other than that, maybe from different uh, people, we can, should be having an independent feedback from groups, which may help us in improving our system. So I would like to have your views on this, sir. <coughs> so uh, audience measurement, as I already pointed out, is an area for innovation. Uh, one is, of course, census-based. So we measure almost nearly everyone who's watching uh, TV. And we, you know, we know exactly what, what they're watching, when they're watching. Uh, but you're right, we need other channels of feedback as well. And a great way is to have an app-based mechanism by which you know, we can frequently poll people, take a survey, take their feedback. They can also you know, flag issues and so on. Uh, so, uh, so, so we should have a smartphone-based application interface that integrates our FPC, that integrates our programming guides, what is, on the, what is airing right now, and then you know, is able to take feedback. I think there's something that we should build soon. Added to this is, as a public broad service broadcasters, we are reaching to public which is not having so many means. Many people may have not have a mobile phone, or they have a mobile phone, they don't have a smartphone. These people are of no consequence to the advertisers, 
because they don't have much buying power. So the advertisers won't go there. They won't take a feedback from there. The, our people will not go. Bark meters will not be installed in such houses, which is having only a single Doodarshan channel. So this is another field which has to be addressed. That we have to reach all strata of society when we are taking these measurements because there are people they don't give feedback, but they just they they are so much engaged in their work and to meet the daily ends. They will just see it as as maybe a news or maybe a program to for entertainment. That's it. They never get into feedback system. Fair enough. I think we have to get better at it. Use different channels, maybe IVR, maybe you know field surveys and so on. Sir, uh, my name is Prakash Pir. I am a BDP in Adhikya. The e-auction process uh, we, which we have conducted in the PTH, I mean, it's a uh, very fast-paced manner we did it. But as, but as a viewer, I have an observation. I mean, we have uh, the auction only for one year. If I connect with one particular channel, maybe two person channel, two person, yes, it will come automatically. But if I connect with any private channel, by the time I connect to me, the channel is off. So we should have uh, some, you know, uh, two, three years payment with the broadcaster. I have some regulatory experience as well, and I have I gone through some of the internet agreement also uh, between broadcast uh, and the operators. So they have, you know, uh, not for one year, they have for uh, three, four, five years. So that consumer can connect I think it's a good, good suggestion. Uh, it's something we can definitely think about in the next uh, next year when we, you know, look at renewing the contracts. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's uh, once we've, uh, you know, built a metadata repository of all our archival content, uh, then the next logical thing will be to make it available, syndicated digitally to various platforms, enforcing digital rights. Uh, I think that's something we have to put in place urgently. Uh, also, we have to ensure that the content that we're creating, like what you said, you know, it is fire and forget. I think that has to stop because one problem is digitizing your legacy content and that has been going on for years. At the same time, we are creating a new problem that we are creating content which is digital ready but is not getting archived in a central repository. So I think both have to be solved. And the moment we get that central repository in place, maybe a cloud-based architecture like has been proposed recently by the committee that looked at it. So once that cloud-based architecture is in place, then the content can be very easily syndicated to you know, multiple parties. Ladies and gentlemen, due to paucity of time, we'll be able to take only the last question. One question. Yeah. <laughs> You're not allowed to ask questions. <laughs> yeah, good.
or at least three papers, etc. Yeah, I think in fact this is something we discussed recently on the radio side, where I said we have so many LRSs, but then each LRS doesn't have talent and it's very hard to get local talent and so on. So some of them are just, you know, doing relay, right? But what if you moved them to a community model where you tied up with a local university, a local institution that takes ownership, right? And you are able to create local content. So a similar model can be experimented with the on the TV side as well. Uh, but then it requires the right partner. So maybe we can start with the IITs, IIS, CIM, some of the bigger institutions where, you know, they have the capacity, the institutional framework to sustain this and then, you know, replicate this model in other places. Five years, well, I can speak for uh, probably what, the next three years. After the other two years, you guys will have to add. <laughs> uh, I think we have to create a DD that people look up to, right? Today, people proudly talk about various brands, right? Delhi Metro is a good example. Maruti used to be a good example, a brand that people would identify with. Isro is a great example that everyone feels proud of. How do we make people proud of Durdarshan? I think for that to happen, we ourselves have to feel proud about Durdarshan. I think that is what we have to create. Uh, so five years from now, can we create that organization? At one point in time, people were able to relate to DD in that way, but that's all nostalgia. Nostalgia will not get us through the next five years. We have to create a, a connect with the youth and they have to feel proud about it. They have to, you know, relate themselves to it. And I think that is uh, the big picture that we'll have to, you know, focus on. Uh, specifically, what will be different? Uh, I think, hopefully, chipsets get into smartphones and we completely disrupt the broadcasting market with a direct-to-mobile service, just like we disrupted DTH, we disrupt DTM. I mean, that is my hope. Let's see if that happens. Thank you so much, sir, for, your, for sharing your perspective and your rich experience with all of us. May I now call upon DG Durdarshan to present a memento to CEO, sir, as a humble token of gratitude. <laughs>